Let's go ahead and pray, and we will jump into our lesson. God in heaven, we uh, we thank you that you're God and you know all things, even before we pray it, even if um, it's distracting to us and we don't always uh, have the right words to say or the right thoughts. We have you and the Holy Spirit communicating for us, make an intercession for us through our pain, our issues, our hurts. We pray for the Marquette family as as, uh, as Dick has gone to be with you, we pray that we have peace and comfort, understanding, hope. Help us to mourn with hope. And Lord, above all, we thank you for your word and the promise of resurrection, because the promise of resurrection is not just about Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead, but the promise of the future resurrection of all of us bodily, not just to be with you in spirit, giving us a spirit, temporary spiritual body, but a physical resurrection that we will be with you always as you rule and reign from this earth. We thank you for that. Thank you for everyone here. Pray for those who are traveling, those who are ill, hurting. Pray for the speed of recovery and their travel back home. Help us, as always, to love one another, to show grace and mercy to one another, as you have shown us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We are in Matthew. We are dealing with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Um, in the last lesson, we talked about the burial of Jesus after the crucifixion. Uh, we looked at the historical account of Jesus being buried. The details of the burial are clear. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, who was a secret disciple of Jesus, breaks his secrecy and buries Jesus in his own new unused tomb. The women were there, by the way. They were there sitting across watching this all occur as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus... Um, teacher of Israel, were there preparing the body and burying Jesus in the traditional manner. Now, we talked last time about the, why the account of the burial is here. And the primary reason is to account for and to demonstrate that Jesus' death is valid and verifiable. He did not swoon. He didn't, they didn't fake it. He died. The burial is vital because we have witnesses that Jesus was indeed dead, that his body was prepared by people uh, that the initial readership would be able to go and question, and that the women were also providing further witness that Jesus was indeed dead and placed in the tomb. And this is the point uh, that, that we want to make sure we understand because it, the burial becomes part of the gospel presentation. We often kind of just skip past it because the importance is his death and his resurrection. The burial provides a substantial a verification that, in fact, did die. And the sealing was also an important concept here because this was to show that there was a that the later deception of having his body stolen by his disciples was a lie. So they showed that they there's no way this could have happened. They could not steal the body. If they, you'd have to go through so many different layers of defenses in order to get past those those soldiers and even then you know you just discredit everything because you have 100 witnesses there saying hey they stole the body so later on the that story will become um, um told but the fact that they had this ceiling that the pharisees insisted upon actually provide verification so the tomb was completely impenetrable and the only valid explanation was not a band of misfits trying to steal a body from a tomb, but actually a supernatural God who enacted the resurrection that no one could have stopped. No one could have stopped. And this brings us now, of course, to the resurrection of Jesus, Matthew 28, 1 through 15. We'll read, and again, we'll make some observations and hopefully not only remember, but hopefully learn some new information concerning this resurrection. First, now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake has occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. 
behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with, his, with fear and great joy and ran to report to his disciples. Behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. There they will see me. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while you were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And the story was widely spread among the Jews at, and is to this day. So it begins in Matthew 28, verse 1, with Mary Magdalene and, an, uh, and the other Mary. Now, the other Mary, we know who that is from the other accounts. This is, <coughs> this is Mary, the mother of James the Less. Not James, the, the brother of, of John, but James the Less. Um, Mark and John also state that there were two other women present, Salome and another um, woman. And so it's, it's you get the impression here that Matthew is focusing on these two women, but it doesn't exclude the fact that there were other women present. So a total of four women went to the tomb that morning. These women, after the Sabbath, are now set out to the tomb to um, before it began to dawn. Now, the Sabbath questions come up a lot of times, and I'm, I'm not going to say a whole lot here about this. I'm only going to say this, that the Sabbath in the Hebrew calendar is different than what we would consider Saturday in our, in our Gregorian calendar. Okay, People start saying, well, it's the first day of the week. According to whom? Not the Gregorian calendar. Matthew was written prior to the days of the week that we have. Saturday through Sunday is not how it was done during the time of Jesus Christ. They had their days of the week, and they set their calendar based upon the Jewish New Year's, which is based upon a 360-day calendar, and then they had a leap month. So when they say the first day of the week, it's not Sunday. It's the first day of the week of the Hebrew calendar. So when you deal with the questions like this, everyone relates it back to the Gregorian calendar, and it's Sunday. He was risen again on Sunday. N no, later on in the 100s, 200s, after the, the calendars, they started switching back. The church, the Christendom, decided to celebrate Resurrection Day on Sundays because that was their first day of the week. And they decided to go ahead and celebrate Sabbaths on Saturday, but that is not how the historical Hebrew Sabbaths and Sundays work out together. Also remember that during a holy week, the entire week is a Sabbath. They're all days of rest. That's all it means, days of rest. It does not mean the seventh day, Now, but it does say the first day of the week. So we do know that this was actually the Saturday or the Hebrew Saturday of the Sabbath. So just for comfort's sake, I just wanted to explain that to you. Everyone gets in a tizzy about this, but that's not how, but Matthew would not be written in accordance with the Gregorian calendar. So in Matthew 28, verse 1, it says that they were the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene, the other day, uh, Mary, came to look at the grave. Okay, now this is also towards the dawn, which means towards the dawn would indicate that this was early in the morning. They probably left while it was still basically dark. Getting to the tomb, according to Luke, dawn had broke. So they left before sunrise, got to the tomb around sunrise. So between that night break, or between the, the dead of night and the actual uh, women getting there, this is when the resurrection would have occurred. Because Jesus was not, ra was not raised at the evening but at the daytime, so at the beginning of that third day. In Matthew 28, 2, and behold, a severe earthquake. Now, I love severe because, you know, in Greek, it's megas. It's a mega earthquake. I love saying that. I just think it's funny. A severe earthquake had occurred. Now, another earthquake. Why do I put another earthquake? What, what happened in Matthew 27? And behold, a veil of the temple was torn into from two from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. 
and tombs were opened, okay? Now the centurion who was there with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, both became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. The earthquake is not uncommon for this area. There's a significant fault going through Israel during this location. But the timing of this earthquake, both at the cross and at the resurrection, are not coincidental. In fact, over in Matthew 28, 2, this other earthquake had a cause. How do I know it was caused? See the word for? That is the word because. Or the it is an explanation of what happened to create the severe earthquake. Because the activity of an angel. The cause of the earthquake was the activity of this angel. A great earthquake had occurred because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. So all that activity, earthquake. Now, the women felt it, no doubt. Jerusalem felt it, 100%. And so once again, you have a physical representation throughout the land of Israel and specifically within Jerusalem that would indicate that something happened. And all of a sudden they start hearing word of a resurrection. They, they You can put two to two very quickly. Why mention the earthquake? Because again, they had the physical representation of something that happened on earth that was supernatural in activity. In Matthew 28 verses three through four, we, uh, and combined with chapter, with verse two as well, we see that Matthew records the activity of the angel prior to the women coming to the tomb. He came, rolled away the stone, and sat upon it, and his appearance was like lightning, his clothes was white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him, that is the angel, and became like dead men. Now, obviously, the, the, the soldiers did not die. So we could say, Big, strong Roman soldiers, trained, fainted for fear of the angel. We always have kind of this awe-striking concept of both masculinity and men, but no matter what happens, when you get into a situation that is supernatural and you start seeing things that, that are impossible, um, you, you basically become like dead men. Now, it is the word hoss. They, did, of course, did not die. But they did get very scared. Now, Matthew records this activity, but notice that who had been around to watch this. I assume that Matthew received this information from the Lord directly through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why do I say that instead of saying, well, obvious, that some people have said that they believe the soldiers, some of them spilled the beans. Um, probably not. Why? Because of the conspiracy that is found in verses 13 through 15, where they take great sums of money to stay quiet. So if they're staying quiet, then there's no impetus for them to go ahead and start sharing other information. Um, that hush money would have been very effective. And I, honestly, I believe that was a very expensive payout, both to the soldiers um, and to everyone that was there. Remember last time we met, um, we kind of calculated there might have been upwards of 100 soldiers there, at least a couple dozen, not just three. So it's not just a simple guard, but basically a, a prevention of, this, of the disciples from coming in and taking the body. When they came to, they probably left because the body of Jesus is not there. You wake up and you see the stone rolled away and you start looking inside. He's not there. What are you going to do? So guard the tomb? No. In fact, this all happened rather quickly. Why do we say that? Because there's no record of soldier activity when the women come. They walk right into the tomb. If, if they were still guarding the tomb, would they just let them go in? No, they would, they're not there. John and, uh, John and Peter later on also go into the tomb. No soldiers. So between the resurrection and the, and the women getting there, Within a, probably a span of about an hour, they, cut, they snap out of it, they leave. Probably also because they're still greatly afeared. 
Now, I always ask this question whenever I talk about this, but I always love the, the question. Why was the stone rolled away? Um, not to let Jesus out, but to show people he was not there. You know, we obviously see later on that he pops in on the disciples in the locked door. He doesn't need to be let out. It's not like the angel, okay, Jesus, you can come out now. He's already gone by the time by the time the, the, the stone is rolled away. Also, I don't believe that the soldiers saw Jesus. Uh, not only that, I think they're fainted, but I think that they did see Jesus. I think their story changes a little bit. I don't think Jesus revealed himself directly to individuals who were not already believers in him. Um, remember when he when you get the, the the story of the resurrection, who does he appear before? He before appears before the eleven. James, the brother of Jesus, and upwards of 500 brethren who are still alive to this day, according to 1 Corinthians 15. I don't think Jesus is walking around Jerusalem going, hey, guys, to unbelievers. So I don't think he showed himself to any of the soldiers or any unbelievers. He showed himself directly to believers and believers alone. So this whole concept of Jesus being let out or, or basically the, 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 you know, we always see in depictions of, plays or movies, Jesus kind of doing the pop out of the, of the tomb. No, he's gone. So they only are allowed to go in so that they can verify that indeed he's not in there. All right. This brings us to Matthew 28, verses 5 through 6. Not 66. That'd be a lot more verses. This is the account of the interaction with the angel with the women that in Jesus was indeed risen from the dead. He says to them, do not be afraid. Um, now, this is a negative particle with a present imperative. A negative particle with a present imperative. A present imperative is uh, a continual action concept as a command. What do you get when you add a negative particle with a present imperative? It means stop. In fact, taking a literal translation with you being in the plural, you all stop fearing. So they were afraid. He's, it's not a greeting, don't be afraid. He's saying, stop being afraid. Why were they afraid? Hmm. They're looking for Jesus. Now, do you get the impression that the angel met them before they got into the tomb in Matthew? If you actually understand the entire harmony and look at what the angel actually says, that here they're looking for Jesus, you'll be able to understand exactly what happened. First of all, the word looking is the tail. Zeteo. It means to try to find something or a significant investigation. Well, they're on their way to the tomb. Are they looking for Jesus? No, they're going to, they know where Jesus is. When they get to the tomb, what don't they find? Jesus. Then they start looking for Jesus. So by the time the angel interacts with them, they have already discovered that he's not in the tomb. In Mark 16, verses 4 through 6, okay, looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right. Now again, we get truncated information. We get details that only we, we need to know, not the entire picture. So in other words, I, even here, I don't think they walked in and saw the man, this young man, this angel, okay? I think they walked in, did some investigation, and all of a sudden, boom, he's there, which would have caused them to also fear a little bit. They were in a white robe, and they were amazed. And they said to him, do not be amazed. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. They walked in, see that, see that he's not there, and all of a sudden, they start doing an investigation, and all of a sudden, the angel came to tell them exactly what they're missing. 
in Luke chapter 24, same idea. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. Now, a lot of people get all confused and they get all, you know, defensive because, oh, well, once it says an angel or a young man, and here's, there's two. But saying there's a man there or an angel was sitting there talking with them does not preclude the fact that there were two people or two angels. Don't read the account and think this is exclusive information. Like, for example, Matthew talks about Mary and Mary. Okay, going there. Well, that doesn't mean that only two went. We know that there are four who went. So don't read it in a concept of being exclusive to that content. It's not contradictory. They're simply just telling you the information that is necessary. The point we want to make, though, dealing with Mark and Luke, is that they were perplexed. That word perplexed indicates that they became full of anxiety and fear because they did not find the body of Jesus because they were going to add some more spices to, to honor him even more. As the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. So their terror, their fear increased when seeing the angel, which is understandable. If anybody does a pop in, it's going to create some anxiety, some muscular fear. But this, this language that they use, you're looking for Jesus, indicates they've already begun their perplexity and their investigation looking around the tomb. Remember, we took, a, we took a look at what a typical tomb looked like. There were several chambers. Um, Joseph of Arimathea's uh, burial spot would not have been suited just for one individual. They would have had catacombs, various different locations, maybe of different compartments and chambers. And they probably were scouring the location. Seeing the clothes there, they probably panicked. Thinking what? Well, we don't have to think. We know in John that Mary goes, somebody stole his body. Even when, Jesus, when she sees Jesus, if you've taken him, tell me, take, take me where he is. Their passion, their fear, their anxiety, their perplexity starts driving them. So you have the angels constantly tell them, stop it. Stop being afraid. Stop being overcome. Even to the point where later on we see Jesus telling him the same thing. Stop being afraid. So these women found the stone, rolled away, entered in the tomb, became perplexed and filled with anxiety and fear, thinking that someone had stole his body. Then they saw the angel. Their fear deepened. And they were told to stop fearing and that he, that is the angel, knew that they were seeking earnestly, investigating, looking around, trying to find clues as to where Jesus is. That is his body. Then the angel tells them he is not here. He has been raised. Now, before that, he says that you're looking for Jesus, the one who has been crucified. Now, once again, we have a situation within our Bible that the translators really have no idea what to do with participles. They, they just don't. They, the, the, the participles become a problematic throughout all the New Testament. And when we get to 1 John on Sundays, it becomes even more problematic for them because they don't know what to do with this. This is an articular participle. It should be translated the one who has been crucified. As an articular participle, it becomes attributive. It tells them something about the, the, the person themselves. It's not what, what, what happened to them. It's not the identification of, the, um, of, of a situation. Rather, it becomes how they are known. It's now an attribute of Jesus. He is the one who has been crucified. How do I know that? Well, once again, we're going. this is the exact same word as a participle. Used by Paul in 1 Corinthians. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God is well pleased the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. That looks like a verb. It is not. It is a participle. In the attributive position, 
Now it is a nathoris, meaning there's no article with this word here, but it's in the exact same structure, but in the in the attributed position of Jesus Christ, meaning the crucified Christ. We preach the crucified Christ is how that should be translated. Similar situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superior speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Participle. The crucified him, basically. We don't talk like that in English, but this is how the Greeks talk. Meaning that his crucifixion has become part of his attribute. Furthermore, this is also understood by what we see in Revelation. Now the word changed. It's no longer the word crucified, but look what it says here in Revelation 5.12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That word that was slain is an articular participle. Worthy is the lamb, the one who was slain. As, a, as, a, as an attributive understanding of who the lamb is, this is the one who was killed. It helps us understand this because we're not just looking at it from the perspective of what happened, but now the exact representation of Jesus, rep the exact representation of the, of the lamb is now attested as the one who was crucified, the one that was slain. It's even used in, in Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the lamb, the one who was slain. Articular participle, understanding that this is an attribute, a description of who the lamb is. Now, this angel describes Jesus this way. Then he says he is not here. He has risen. Ah. Again, I geek out over these kind of things. I really enjoy looking at these words and in, in, in descriptions because we, we miss so much in our translations. Um, risen is agero. It's one of the first words I learned how to pronounce because it's an egg with an arrow, agero. Yes. And it's rising up, so it's it's very interesting. So I, 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 how I remember some of these words from old Greek classes. Agero is an aorist indicative. Now that makes sense, right? An aorist indicative is simply an act, um, a, sin, a single act in time. Usually, when you have an aorist indicative, it's in the past. Now, sometimes prophecy also is aorist indicative because to God, you know, it's all as if it's already happened. However, we know that the way that this is spoken here. It's already happened. It's already occurred. It's not happening. It's already occurred. But that's not the thing that the, the, the most interesting part. The most interesting part is what voice is this in? For my language persons, active or passive? It's passive. The act of raising was done to him. If you just read this, you just, oh, you just, you just risen up as if it's not an activity um, that is attributed to a particular individual. But this is not the whole story. Okay. Yes, Jesus was raised up by whom? Well, with this, we go to several different places. First, Acts chapter 2, 29 to 33. And it says, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, still dead. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God has sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. Now remember, we do that not to try to be, you know, all Hebrew but we have to understand that the word Christ is the same word as Messiah. It's not a derivative. It's not his last name. But speaking to the, to the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, here, Peter's making a distinction of God being the father, the head of the triunity. So he is raised to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, 
is poured forth in which you both see and hear. So we have one passage here, which we see who was responsible for raising Jesus Christ. God, specifically the Father, reaffirmed in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through, by means of the glory of the Father, so we too might walk into his life. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Very clear. The Father is responsible for raising Jesus from the dead. We also have Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? The Holy Spirit is responsible for raising Jesus from the dead. But that's not the whole of the story. Because in John chapter 2, verses 16 to 22, it says this. And those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written of him, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered and said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said it took 46 years to build this temple and you raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. So who's responsible for raising Jesus from the dead? Well, if that's not clear. John 10, verses 17 through 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I laid down my life so that I would take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up. This commandment I have received from my father. Acts chapter 2. Sorry, I just I thought I had a mistake here. I'll read this. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hand of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. This phrase right here, since it was impossible for him, Jesus, to be held in its power, means that death could not, in any way, is it is not possible for death to hold Jesus down. So, coupled with John 2, John 10, and Acts, in Acts 2, 24, we see that Jesus himself is responsible for raising Jesus from the dead. Now, this is one of the proofs what we have, by the way. And then we go through the, the triunity and why we understand that there is a triunity to the, to the Godhood. Because each person is responsible within Scripture for raising Jesus from the dead. The triune God is responsible for raising Jesus from the dead. Hmm. I always find that completely fascinating looking through those verses. Going back to Matthew, he tells him in verse 6, He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he was laying. Now, they have already seen it. But he calls upon them to take a quick, to take another look. Look at, examine this. In other words, you walk into a room and you don't see a body. You see something else. You're not really, you're confused. You're in amazement. Your emotions are taking over. You have not fully come to a proper conclusion. 
what do they see? Well, in John chapter 20, we get a glimpse of what they saw. Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. This is after Mary came back and told them what she found. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran faster than Peter. I love that John puts that in there. I beat you in a race. And came to the tomb first, and stooping in and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he did not go in. John's careful. Gets there first, but doesn't go in the tomb, just kind of, kind of peeks around the corners. Peter also came following him and basically just pushed John out of the way and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrapping laying there and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So you get this picture here. The wrappings is, is kind of mummified. In other words, let's go ahead and say Jesus could have just woke up. Um, how do you get loosed? So the picture you have there is that he was raised from the dead and kind of like went through the linings, but he still had the face cloth on. So he took off the face cloth, wrapped it, and put it off somewhere else, apart from the burial cloths. If you look at that situation, you're going to go, wait a second. The burial cloths, they're not full of anything, but they're still wrapped. But the face cloth is moved over to the side. Looking at that situation, obviously believing in the power of God, understanding that supernatural events can occur, you can only conclude one thing. Jesus was raised from the dead, if you investigated it properly. And so the, the angel takes the women back to the barrel spot to where he was laying and say, look, Look at this, okay? And that is what they see. Now, I find it interesting, going back over to Matthew, that they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm still in verse 7. He says to them, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, what we see here in Matthew from the rest of this passage is that Matthew skips a lot of information. He skips to head to the meeting in Galilee. There is no interaction with the women and the disciples. They run into Jesus, and then it goes into the story of how the lie or the conspiracy gets spread. But where is the women talking to the disciples? Where is the disciples still being in fear and all of a sudden Jesus doing a couple pop-ins? Where's the road to Emmaus and Luke? It's not there. But I, I find that fascinating. I ask the question, why is it not there? To which I have no answer. I have no idea why it's not there. So we only can say what's there and kind of conclude one thing. Matthew's only interested in the facts and the fact that they go on and meet Jesus in Galilee. So in Matthew 28, 16, we see the meetup. The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now we're going to come back to this next week, but I find this very fascinating again that they just skipped over a whole lot of information. But when you take a look at this as a good storyteller, what does a good storyteller do? Well, sometimes they can give clues. And then we forget what the clues are. Because what we don't realize is that this was already stated in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 32. After I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now, do you think this is the only time it's stated? Probably not. We, we get information as we need it. Jesus has been teaching about his death, his burial, and his resurrection for some time now. And this was an overall plan. Listen, here's the plan. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to crucify me, and I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to, rise ahead, I'm going to raise again, and I'll meet you in Galilee. He is, buried, he is then crucified and buried, and what do the disciples do? 
they sit around like a bunch of emotional basket cases in Jerusalem, waiting. For what? I don't know. They're just overcome. And so the message of Matthew is, go to where I told you to go. Now, John and Luke both record different instances with the risen Lord prior to the meeting in Galilee. But I find this interesting that they're basically just being told over and over again, here, stick to the plan. Now in Matthew 28, 8 through 10, Jesus meets up with the women. They went ahead to go meet with them. But Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take the word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. Now, while they're on their way, some, no, sorry, I, I meant to stop there. Jesus just reiterates what the angels already told him. Why? They already got the message and they went to go ahead and go tell. Why meet up with them again? Well, John chapter 20 gives us some details. Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. She heard the angel. She saw where the body was laid. Mary stands, steps out and begins to weep. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. The two angels were was sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laying. Why are you weeping? Because they've taken my Lord. And I don't know what they did to him. When she had said this, they turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And they did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposed to him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where they laid him. She's already received the words from the angel. What happened? Emotion, perplexity, anxiety, sometime overcome, plain speech. <clears throat> Have you ever been so anxious and so emotional that you don't believe your eyes? You don't believe your ears? You don't believe what you're experiencing? You're just, you, you have a preconceived conclusion in your head of what happened. And it takes several different, stop it, to break you out of it. This is exactly what's happening to them. Matthew just tells a very curt, straightforward, we went in there, they heard the message of the angel, they go, yay, and then on the way there, hey, we see Jesus, and we, go, and we keep on going. It's not how it happened. They went in, they get emotional, they get in a basket case, they're, they're a complete wreck. The angel tells them, they go, okay, they don't understand, they walk out, they emotion overcome them, and all of a sudden, Jesus kind of reaffirms the angel's message. Now here, it's only recorded about Mary. Okay? But... If you look at Matthew 8, 28 through, 8 through 10, at least two and probably all four all see Jesus as well. <clears throat> so in the full compilation of the four accounts, we see a wide repetition of proving that Jesus was alive. The angel's testimony that what they saw, Jesus appearing to them themselves, and not only to the women, but also the disciples. Jesus keeps on reaffirming his resurrection, which leads me to a conclusion. The angel and Jesus both take great care and patience with them until they all come to terms with the truth that Jesus is risen from the dead. Again, they're just overcome with this emotion that it distracts them from what they're actually experiencing. I don't think I'd be any different, to be honest with you. Because I get stubborn. I get, a, I get a preconceived notion in my head. I think I know the answer to this question. And regardless of what's in front of me, sometimes I ignore the truth. And it takes a couple of different instances for it to happen. So I think we're, we put ourselves right in the situation. Sadness, overwhelming, anxiety, what's happening here. And it's hard to see what's actually in front of them. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, 28, 11 through 15, because I dealt with this in chapter 27, dealing with... Um, the, uh, the the burial, but this section here is just an explanation of what had become the conspiracy to cover up the resurrection. Um, and so what we just see here is the actual account of how that it came about. And I think that Matthew 
in the, in the stating this is basically bookending both the burial and the ceiling and also how well and the explanation so he tells them the entire story because people in israel specifically people in israel have heard the widespread conspiracy that the disciples came and stole the body so why is it only in matthew because matthew was written primarily to jews in judea about their king mark was written to jews outside of judea in the diaspora greek-speaking jews who probably had not heard that conspiracy why they're not in israel luke and john don't have it either matthew has this because the conspiracy obviously was there and the readership would have already heard that conspiracy and matthew is telling the whole story so that they can explain the conspiracy um, appropriately now we also know that this particular lie makes no sense when they actually think about it. The lie would indicate primarily the fact that the, um, the soldiers had to lie about their own guilt. Failure meant they were to be executed. Now, the fact that Jesus' body was gone, regardless of how that would happen, would look bad to the Rome, to the to, to, the, to them, and that would mean their death. I think they went to the Pharisees, not to report to them what happened, but to say, help. Hey, we saw the angel. We're scared to death. When we came to, Jesus' body is gone. And they go, well, let's go and say, while you were sleeping, I stole and we'll take care of the rest. I don't think they saw Jesus coming out. I think that they went to the Pharisees to look for help so that they would survive the day. And so they were bribed. Don't say anything. They said, sure, we won't say anything. And they took care of Pilate and probably paid off Pilate a significant amount of money as well so that they would not kill the soldiers. To conclude this, though, in the resurrection of Jesus, the truth of the resurrection is an indispensable part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people have taken upon themselves to try to limit information about the gospel. They want to have and I'm sure you've heard about the crossless gospel, of which I am an ad adamant anti-crossless gospel person. Just un it's unscriptural, and I think it does it. It is a, a slight. Well, I don't want to say slight. It's a blasphemy to try to preach the gospel without the it, without the activity of Jesus Christ. They take verses out of context and try to limit. But First Corinthians 15 makes it clear that the resurrection is intricate. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Intricate. Later on, verse 12. Now, if Christ has been preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. The gospel is a proclamation of the person, activity, and offer of Jesus Christ. The activity of Jesus Christ is bound to the death, burial, and resurrection. It has to be taught. For those who don't want to talk about the cross, they can, oh, it's just details. No, it's not just details. It's intricate. Not only that, but the resurrection. I recently had an encounter with an individual talking about Genesis because, obviously, I'm touching on apologetics dealing with the proof that we have a young earth and that's a literal six-day creation. He goes, oh, you don't want to confuse people with the supernatural. Just tell them about Jesus. I go, what's more fantastic? Okay, if you, if you actually think about the activity on the earth, that God created the heavens and earth in literal six days, that's too crazy. What about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Is that crazy too? The supernatural 
and the activity of Jesus Christ in the supernatural is part of the proclamation. Yes, it sounds supernatural, because it is. Yes, it sounds unfathomable. Why? We've never seen this before. But it doesn't mean it's not true. Don't be afraid of the supernatural, of the things we can't really point to on a camera. Rely upon the truth and make sure that we make this part of the proclamation. It's important today. It'll be important during Resurrection Sundays, and it's important always. Resurrection is intricate. Let's pray. God of heaven, thank you again for your word that we know that um, our friends, our family members, our loved ones who are in you, who believe in you, will be raised again. We thank you for that. We find it comforting and truly amazing. And it's all hinged around the resurrection of Jesus. Help us to come to terms with it, to not be like the apostles and the women who took time to ignore what they're experiencing. Help us to understand the truth, to understand who you are, to see that you are not bound by what we see in our normal lives. You are supernatural. You're the God above creation, God of creation. You demonstrated your power through the resurrection of the Son. We praise you for that, for you are our hope and our salvation. To Jesus, let me pray. Amen.